Hello, my name is John Nagoski, and I'm a native speaker of English from Wisconsin in the USA. I would like to introduce to you my English reading channel with questions and answers. Outwitting the Devil by Napoleon Hill Chapter 10 Self-Discipline what preparation must one undergo before being able to move with definiteness of purpose at all times? One must gain mastery over self. This is the second of the seven principles. The person who is not master of himself can never be master of others. Lack of self-mastery is, of itself, the most destructive form of indefiniteness. The person who is not master of himself can never be master of others. How true this is. Think of our political leaders who have fallen from grace because they could not control their own behavior. How can we trust them to control ours? Where should one begin when making a start of control over self? By mastering the three appetites responsible for most of one's lack of self-discipline. The three appetites are the desire for food, the desire for expression of sex, the desire to express loosely organized opinions. Does man have other appetites which need control? Yes, many of them. But these three are the ones which should be conquered first. When a man becomes master of these three appetites, he has developed enough self-discipline to conquer easily those of lesser importance. But these are natural appetites. They must be indulged if one is to be healthy and happy. To be sure, they are natural appetites, but they are also dangerous because people who have not mastered themselves overfeed the appetites. Self-mastery contemplates sufficient control over the appetites to enable one to feed them what they need and withhold food not needed. Your viewpoint is both interesting and educational. Describe the details through which I may understand how and under what circumstances people overfeed the appetites. Take the desire for physical food, for example. The majority of people are so weak in self-discipline, they fill their stomachs with combinations of rich food which please the taste, but overwork the organs of digestion and elimination. They pour into their stomachs both quantity and combinations of food which the body chemists can dispose of only by converting the food into deadly toxic poisons. These poisons clog and stagnate the body's sewer system until it slows down in its work of elimination of waste matter. After a while, the sewer system stops working altogether, and the victim has what he calls constipation. By that time, he is ready for the hospital. Auto-intoxication, or body sewer poisoning, takes the machinery of the brain and rolls it into something resembling a wad of putty. The victim then becomes sluggish in his physical movements and mentally irritable and fussy. If he could only take one good look at and one bad smell of his sewer system, he would be ashamed to look himself in the face. People who eat wisely and keep their body sewers clean handicap me because a clean body sewer generally means a sound body and a brain that functions properly. Imagine if your imagination can be stretched that far, how any human being can move with definiteness of purpose with his body sewer filled with enough poison to kill a hundred people if it were injected into their bloodstream directly. Here again Napoleon Hill is far ahead of his time. Science eventually caught up with Hill and even surpassed his intuition about physical processes and how they link to mental and emotional health. I never thought of auto-intoxication as being one of your devices of control over people, and I am utterly shocked to know how many people are victims of this subtle enemy. Let's hear what you have to say of the other two appetites. Well, take the desire for sex expression. Now there is a force with which I master the weak and the strong, the old and the young, the ignorant and the wise. In fact, I master all who neglect to master sex. How can one master the emotion of sex? By the simple process of transmuting that emotion into some form of activity other than copulation. 
Sex is one of the greatest of all forces which motivate human beings. Because of this fact, it is also one of the most dangerous forces. If humans would control their sex desires and transmute them into a driving force with which to carry on their occupation, that is, if they spend on their work one half the time they dissipate in pursuit of sex, they would never know poverty. Do I understand you to imply there is a relationship between sex and poverty? Yes, where sex is not under definite control. If allowed to run its natural course, sex will quickly lead one into the habit of drifting. Is the habit of overindulgence in sex as dangerous as the habit of taking narcotics or liquor? There is no difference between these habits. Both lead to hypnotic control through the habit of drifting. Just what damage is there in overindulgence of sex? The greatest damage is that it depletes the source of man's greatest driving force and wastes, without adequate compensation, man's creative energy. What relative position of importance would you give to the need for accurate knowledge on the subject of sex? It is next to the top of the list. There is but one thing of greater importance to human beings, that is accurate thought. There is but one thing of greater importance to human beings, that is accurate thought. Tell us now about the third appetite and let's see what it has to do with self-discipline. The habit of expressly loosely organized opinions is one of the most destructive of habits. Its destructiveness consists in its tendency to influence people to guess instead of searching for the facts when they form opinions, create ideas, or organize plans. The habit develops a grasshopper mind, one that jumps from one thing to another but never completes anything. And of course, carelessness in the expression of opinions leads to the habit of drifting. From there, it is only a step or two until one is bound by the law of hypnotic rhythm, which automatically prohibits accurate thinking. The habit of expressing loosely organized opinions is one of the most destructive of habits. What other disadvantages are there in free expression of opinions? The person who talks too much informs the world of his aims and plans and gives to others the opportunity to profit by his ideas. Wise men keep their plans to themselves and refrain from expressing uninvited opinions. This prevents others from appropriating their ideas and makes it difficult for others to interfere with their plans. Why do so many people indulge in the habit of expressing uninvited opinions? The habit is one way of expressing egotism and vanity. The desire for self-expression is inborn in people. The motive behind the habit is to attract the attention of others and to impress them favorably. Yes, what other disadvantages has the habit? The person who insists on talking seldom has an opportunity to learn by listening to others. The only dependable power available to any human being, the power of their own thoughts, the only power they can control and may rely upon. This is the end of chapter 10. Chapter 11. Learning from Adversity Is failure ever a benefit to man? Yes, indeed. Learning from adversity is the third of the seven principles. But few people know that every adversity brings with it the seed of an equivalent advantage. Still fewer people know the difference between temporary defeat and failure. If this knowledge were generally known, I would be deprived of one of my strongest weapons of control over human beings. But I understood you to say that failure is one of your greatest allies. I got the impression from your confession that failure causes people to lose ambition and quit trying, and then you take them over without opposition on their part. That is just the point. I take them over after they quit trying. If they knew the difference between temporary defeat and failure, they would not quit when they meet with opposition from life. If they knew that every form of defeat and all failures bring with them the seed of unborn opportunity, they would keep on fighting and win. 
Success usually is but one short step beyond the point where one quits fighting. What part then does failure play in helping an individual break the grip on a hypnotic rhythm after that law has been fastened upon his mind? Failure brings a climax in which one has the privilege of clearing his mind of fear and making a new start in another direction. Failure proves conclusively that something is wrong with one's aims or the plans by which the object of those aims is sought. Failure is the dead end of the habit path one has been following, and when it is reached, it forces one to leave that path and take up another, thereby creating a new rhythm. But failure does more than this. It gives an individual an opportunity to test himself wherein he may learn how much willpower he possesses. Failure also forces people to learn many truths they would never discover without it. Study the lives of people who achieve outstanding success in any calling and observe with profit that their success is usually in exact ratio to their experiences of defeat before succeeding. Failure brings a climax in which one has the privilege of clearing his mind of fear and making a new start in another direction. Is this all you have to say of the advantages of failure? No, I have barely begun. Observe carefully and you will see that everywhere in nature there is always at work a natural law which gives eternal change to all matter, all energy, and to the power of thought. The only permanent thing in the universe is is change. Eternal, inexorable change th through which every atom of matter and every unit of energy has the opportunity to properly relate itself to all other units of matter and energy. And every human being has the opportunity and the privilege of properly relating himself to all other human beings, no matter how many mistakes he makes or how many times or in what ways he may be defeated. When mass failure overtakes a nation, such as the 1929 World Business Depression, the circumstance is in perfect harmony with nature's plan to break up man's habits and give out fresh opportunities. The beauty of publishing this book now, during the current economic turmoil, is that nature is once again breaking up man's habits and presenting fresh opportunities. Is that all you have to say of the connection between hypnotic rhythm and human relationships? No, I've just begun. Remember, while I am talking, I'm speaking of the influence of hypnotic rhythm in connection with all human relationships. Men who succeed in business do so entirely because of the way they relate themselves to their associates and to others outside of the business. Professional men who succeed do so largely because of the manner in which they relate themselves to their clients. It is much more important for the lawyer to know people and to know the laws of nature than it is to know the law. And the doctor is a failure before he starts unless he knows how to relate himself to his patients so as to establish their faith in him. Marriage succeeds or fails entirely because of the manner in which the participants relate themselves to one another. Proper relationships in marriage begins with a proper motive for the marriage. Most marriages do not bring happiness because the contracting parties neither understand nor attempt to understand the law of hypnotic rhythm, through the operation of which every word they speak, every act in which they engage, and every motive by which they are inspired to deal with each other, is picked up and woven into a web that entangles them in controversial misery or gives them the wings of freedom through which they soar above all forms of unhappiness. Every newly made acquaintanceship between people ripens into friendship and then into spiritual harmony, sometimes called love, or plants a germ of suspicion and doubt which evolves and grows into open rebellion, according to the way in which the participants in the acquaintanceship relate themselves to one another. The proper relationship is one that brings to all connected with it or affected by it some form of benefit. Take a moment to inventory your relationships at home, at work, and at play. List the relationships that seem in need of improvement and keep them in your mind as you continue reading. 
What then is an improper relationship? Any relationship between people which damages anyone or brings any form of misery or unhappiness to any of the individuals. How can improper relationships be corrected? By change of mind of the person causing the improper relationship or by changing the persons to the relationship. When you speak of business leaders who succeed because they know how to pick men, you might more correctly say they succeed because they know how to associate minds which harmonize naturally. Knowing how to pick people successfully for any definite purpose in life is based upon ability to recognize the types of people whose minds naturally harmonize. Stay focused on adversity, if you will. If there are possible benefits to be found through adversity, name some of them. Adversity relieves people of vanity and egotism. It discourages selfishness by proving that no one can succeed without the cooperation of others. Adversity forces an individual to test his mental, physical, and spiritual strength. It thus brings him face to face with his weaknesses and gives him the opportunity to bridge them. Adversity forces one to seek ways and means to definite ends by meditation and introspective thought. This often leads to the discovery and use of the sixth sense through which one may communicate with infinite intelligence. Adversity breaks old habits of thought and gives one an opportunity to form new habits. Therefore, it may serve to break the hold of hypnotic rhythm and change its operation from negative to positive ends. What is the greatest benefit one may receive through adversity? The greatest benefit of adversity is that it may, and generally does, Force one to change one's thought habits, thus breaking and redirecting the force of hypnotic rhythm. In other words, failure always is a blessing when it forces one to acquire knowledge or to build habits that lead to the achievement of one's major purpose in life. Is that correct? Yes, and something more. Failure is a blessing when it forces one to depend less upon material forces and more upon spiritual forces. Many human beings discover their other selves, the forces which operate through the power of thought, only after some catastrophe deprives them of the full and free use of their physical bodies. When a man can no longer use his hands and his feet, he usually begins to use his brain. Thus he puts himself in the way of discovering the power of his own mind. The devil brings in the other self here, revealing how we can use our power of thought and our other selves to discover our true power and major purpose. What benefits may be derived from the loss of material things? Money, for example? The loss of material things may teach many needed lessons, none greater, however, than the truth that man has control over nothing and has no assurance of the permanent use of anything except his own power of thought. I wonder if this is not the greatest benefit available through adversity. No, the greatest potential benefit of any circumstance, which causes one to make a fresh start, is that it provides an opportunity to break the grip of hypnotic rhythm and set up a new set of thought habits. New habits offer the only way out for people who fail. Most people who escape from the negative to the positive operation of the law of hypnotic rhythm do so only because of some form of adversity which forces them to change their thought habits. Is an adversity apt to break one's self-reliance and cause one to give up hope? It has that effect on those whose willpower is weak through long-established habits of drifting. It has the opposite effect on those who have not been weakened through drifting. The non-drifter meets with temporary defeat and failure but his reaction to all forms of adversity is positive. He fights instead of giving up and usually wins. Life gives no one immunity against adversity, but life gives to everyone the power of positive thought, which is sufficient to master all circumstances of adversity and convert them into benefits. The individual is left with the privilege of using or neglecting to use his prerogative right to think his way through all adversities. Every individual is forced either to use his thought power 
for the attainment of definite positive ends, or by neglect or design, uses power for the attainment of negative ends. There can be no compromise, no refusal to use the mind. The law of hypnotic rhythm forces every individual to give some degree of use, either negative or positive, to his mind, but it does not influence the individual as to which use he will make of his mind. The non-drifter meets with temporary defeat and failure, but his reaction to all forms of adversity is positive. He fights instead of giving up and usually wins. Am I to understand from what you say that every adversity is a blessing? No, I did not say that. I said there is the seed of an equivalent advantage in every adversity. I did not say there was the full-blown flower of advantage, just the seed. Usually the seed consists of some form of knowledge, some idea or plan, or some opportunity, which would not have been available except through the change of thought habits forced by the adversity. Life gives no one immunity against adversity, but life gives to everyone the power of positive thought, which is sufficient to master all circumstances of adversity and convert them into benefits. This is the end of chapter 11.